Good afternoon. Um, thank you for being here with us today. I'm Sahar Bagheri. I had content for Prime Video in France. So when we were preparing with the Cannes Film Festival uh, for a Prime Video Film Strategy session, independently, the initiative was born across the board to organize this panel um, on Iran and cinema today. So thank you to the Film Market and Anahid Guillaume and Serge for making it happen. Um, it was pretty obvious that this is the year to honor Iranian cinema and cinema made by Iranians, knowing for um, how the volume of Iranian movies have grown internationally, as well as their success and recognition. And while at the same time, Iranian cinema inside Iran is experiencing strong repression. And this is why it's important to differentiate between the Iranian cinema of the diaspora outside Iran and Iranian film production inside Iran, which itself is bipolarized uh, between on one hand national production on mainstream propaganda and closely tied to the Islamic regime, and on the other hand independent cinema. So today we plan to discuss not only the editorial questions of evolving social representation in diaspora and independent cinema, but we also look into the multiple challenges and the risks to make these movies um, inside and outside Iran from an economic and also human standpoint. And also a topic to discuss, what about the support of the international cinema industry um, in such context? What are the roles of the institutions, the regulatory, the international production uh, companies to support the diaspora cinema and independent cinema. So to look into this um, with me today, um, I have uh, Zahra Amir Ebrahimi, actress and producer. So Zahra, you are known from for Tehran Taboo, um, White Paradise and Holy Spider, uh, for which you won the Palme d'Or for Best Actress last year, directed by Ali Abbasi. Um, Sepide Farsi, director and writer, including of documentary Tehran Without Permission, Seven Veils, Red Rose, and The Siren, which opened Berlin's uh, Panorama section this year. Mila Dalami, director and writer, known for The Charmer and Opponent, which premiered at this year's Berlinale. Kave Farnam, independent Iranian producer and writer who collaborated with uh, movie director Mohammad Rasulov arrested and detained last year on several award-winning productions, it in including There Is No Evil, um, who, who had the Golden Bear in 2020, and A Man of Integrity, which won Un Certain Regard in Cannes. And last, Hassal Bahiri, you're a doctor in semiology and linguistics with a specialization in Iranian cinema. So thank you all for being on stage today. Um, but before we start, um, uh, yesterday, the Iranian Judicial Authority announced the execution of three men, and I think, uh, Sepide, maybe you want to take the lead on saying a few words. Good afternoon, and thanks for being here. Um, we all come from a country where um, this um, um, discussion about whether or not cinema, art, and politics can be separated or should be separated or not is not relevant. Uh, Iran is a country where politics is not, not in our hearts, but it's imprisoning us we as citizens, as artists, filmmakers, intellectuals, uh, human beings. And uh, I would like you to have a look at these three faces. Sorry, I haven't brought a <laughs> bigger. Um, these three men were executed yesterday at dawn with the morning prayer, as they do in Iran. And uh, I would like you to all stand up, please. We are not only mourning, but we are angry, as Kave very precisely and justly said. And I would like you to observe a minute of not only silence, but respect to them who lost their lives for freedom in Iran.
the last message they sent out was do not let them kill us. We couldn't stop that, unfortunately, but uh, I think we'll go to the end of this regime soon, hopefully, all of us together, with you, with the help of the rest of the free world. Thank you. Thank you so much. So, with that being said, um, I think we would like to talk about um, censorship, first of all. So, since the 80s, censorship has been applied in a discretionary manner, um, stipulating that films must conform to Islamic morality. And these restrictions forced movie directors in Iran to be creative and to represent certain situations on screen, uh, creating a cinema on symbols and suggestions um, as Al, how has the representation of Iranian society in cinema evolved over time, and in particular related to the women life freedom movement? Thank you, uh, Saha. Thank you, everybody, to, to be here. Um, it's difficult to talk about cinema after what we said, but talking about cinema in Iran is talking about the society, uh, as we will see, I think, in this panel. Um, uh, the, um, to answer your question, the, the post-revolutionary Iranian cinema uh, has become an important voice of uh, resistance in Iran uh, since the late 80s. Um, this cinema, which is faced uh, with very strong censorship, uh, the strongest in the world, has managed to bypass the, the blurred lines of censorship um, in a subtle way to, to show the problems of Iranian society. Uh, it demands, etc. Uh, one of the major evolution uh, of Iranian cinema concerns the representation of women. Um, with the advent of the Islamic Republic in 1979, Iranian cinema had to rebuild itself above all uh, on the basis of the rejection of the film Farsi, the dominant model of Iranian cinema from uh, 50s until the 1979 revolution with recurring elements such as dancing, singing, bowlings, and superstars. Um, the idea was therefore to create a proposal for an Islamicized uh, alternative uh, to counter the images uh, considered decadent uh, in Western cinema. In the absence of clear and precise regulation, uh, filmmakers began to censor themselves uh, at the beginning of the revolution. Uh, women were kept out of the forefront of the cinematographic scene. Uh, then they had only a pale, smooth, faithful image of a pious mother. Um, but they were finally able to find their place with a strong presence on the screen at the eight, uh, end of the 80s. The representation of women was thus modeled until this period on an idyllic and perfect image uh, that the Islamic Republic wanted to give them in uh, search of a cultural purification. Um, reflecting the, the paradox of the Islamic Revolution in Iran, which on the one hand considers women through its laws as uh, second class uh, citizens, and on the other hand, um, negotiation after negotiation, accept uh, a presence of women in the uh, public sphere. Iranian cinema has uh, uh, evolved particularly with regard of the representation of women. So from the doll-like image of film Farsi, they have come uh, as close as possible to the reality of the lives of Iranian women. So today, uh, single parents, family, uh, divorce, and women fighting for their rights have become the latest motive of Iranian uh, cinema. So uh, the Islamic Republic, by wailing its women and imposing codes of modesty, a fat in Persian, on the screen has not been able to prevent a model of, um, sorry, a modern representation of them. So, to finish for this question, it is not surprising for me today to see all these courageous women at the forefront of the protest scene shouting women life freedom. Uh, because since the late 80s, Iranian cinema has not ceased to depict a strong and intelligent Iranian woman fighting against the patriarchal system and um, for their independence. Uh, the demands of a struggle of Iranian women have been the leitmotiv of Iranian cinema ever since.
Thank you so much, Asar. And um, Safidi, I think when you presented the gaze um, to evaluate conformity with uh, Islamic morality, uh, you went through such kind of censorship, but not in terms of um, the political aspect of your movie, but more in terms of the women-men relationship issues. Is that it? Yes, that was um, um, partially the case. I, um, <laughs> to, to give you the picture, a broader picture, I had um, um, tried, or for a while I did try, to make films within the um, rules and the red lines of the um, uh, morality and Islamic art, I, I mean the, the, the ongoing censorship uh, uh, bureau in Iran, so that Iranians back then, I'm talking about uh, almost 20 years ago, um, inside Iran could watch my films. It never happened because all of them were censored. The Gaze was uh, the second or the third uh, film that I was uh, making in Iran, and uh, the rules go that you send uh, a script to get um, the permission to shoot, shooting permission. Back then it was even much more strict because um, it was really impossible to have a, uh, a team, a crew, uh, doing the film underground as now it has become with the digital, you know, uh, means and also with the resistance of all the uh, fellow artists and filmmakers who are doing things for years now. But back then it was very, uh, even more strict. So I send the script and it's um, depicting the return of a um, left uh, wing intellectual from exile to Paris and I had casted uh, Hamid Danishba who himself was um, this, uh, had lived this um, and um, the shooting starts and we go accordingly to the the script, which I, I hadn't hidden, it was um, all the message was metaphoric, you know. And uh, but as uh, you were pointing to, the, the 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 funniest part is that when the film is finished, you have to go again and show the final cut of the film before you get the visa, so that the film is released. And hence, it was sent, and it was uh, the end of um, Khatami's second mandate as uh, president. And uh, Ahmadinejad was arriving, and it was um, the members of the censorship committee had not changed yet. So I thought, well, I got the permission. I shot the film. It's going to be screened. Uh, it never happened because uh, they called me in and they said so. Uh, and the the, the most uh, touchiest part of the film for them was not the left wing background of the character who was returning from exile, not the metaphor I had put of um, the um, repression of the dissidents in the 80s, because all of that was very metal, because I knew I couldn't go um, up front. But uh, the, the, um, uh, the touchiest point of them was the ending sequence of the film, which was um, a man and a woman in a hotel room, and uh, they were having a, a conversation about their past love. And so they say, well, you know that uh, an unmarried couple cannot go to a hotel room. And I said, yeah, but this is a film and nothing happens anyway. They just talk and they say, no, but, uh, you know, this is really giving a bad example. And, uh, and we're talking about 2005, you know. And, um, and anyway, it is forbidden. And how come they even let you shoot the film in a real hotel? All of that is uh, against the law and all. And so I said... Uh, listen, nothing, it's all verbal and there is no touching and, you know, so why are you so offended? And, and they kept saying, but this, this kind of um, uh, situation is really setting uh, an immoral example and it's just uh, unacceptable. And so you have to cut the scene. I said, but the film without this ending is meaningless and I would not do it. And so I, then I suggested that... Uh, and I, I, you know, this quest discussion goes on for like uh, hours. And uh, at the end, I, I suggest that I can, I would accept to cut the image, but to leave the sound. If you want, I'll put a black, uh, three minutes of black, and just that conversation, because otherwise the film is meaningless. And that they really, of course, I was joking, but so they really got angry, and they said, but that's even worse. What are you talking about? This means that. You know, you never know when they have a black image and a man and a woman talking about love, what, what happens? And I said, I don't know what happens, you tell me. So it ended up <laughs> with the whole film being censored, never screened in Iran. And they told me, don't insist, because um, 
you will have even more trouble. <laughs> so <laughs> and then I took the film in my luggage out to Rotterdam Film Festival where it premiered and then it was released outside and uh, in France and elsewhere and uh, and of course I got in trouble because uh, I couldn't make films anymore after that uh, for sure. Uh, uh, anyway, that was the <laughs> so to, to give you a picture. And, and your last movie, The Siren, um, it's coming to the theaters on June 28th. So it, it seems from your personal experience and uh, your uh, intent to bring back the awareness of the Iran-Iraq war. And al also you, you co-wrote and directed the movie Red Rose, um, describing the social revolt after Ahmadinejad deserved election in 2009. And what I find interesting in, the in this movie is that you describe two ways to protest, one through books and ideology, and one through um, social protest on the street and with social media. C can you tell us a bit more about how your work overall resonates with today's situation in Iran? Um, to start from Red Rose first, um, yes, that was a project uh, which we, we were all like we are now. Uh, back in 2009, we really, all of us delved into the uh, protests. I had just come back from Iran a week before the elections and um, to Paris and I knew I could not go back um, after that it's because I had just made Tehran without permission and um, which was uh, which premiered in Locarno so that was the end of my my, my adventures of filmmaking in inside the country but I was not willing and I will not give up making films about Iran, even though I do them outside. So Red Rose uh, stemmed from there. Uh, we, Javad, we had the idea, it was his idea actually, to write and, and show, depict a, a love story with that uprising background uh, beyond the taboos of sex politics and all in the image, which is, you know, uh, for those who've seen the film or who will see, you will understand. Um, we just, you know, um, er erased the red lines, uh, you know, um, and of course, all of the crew who worked with us, the Iranian crew, uh, knew that they none of them could go back to Iran after that film. Uh, and the idea behind it was to um, show the um, gap between the generations, the, the first generation, our generations, who uh, generation who had lived through the... Um, 79 uprising and the so-called revolution and the younger generation who were down on the streets fighting as they are now and uh, to, to make this bridge between them. And it was partially the ideology, partially real politics on the streets and, and, and the idea of showing this through a love story and, and of course the repression that mm. ends the film. I don't want to spoil the ending, but um, it did resonate, I think, very strongly, uh, and we, what we did, and it was very important for us to somehow uh, allow the people inside Iran to show it. So we uploaded the film on a platform and made a Google app to enable people from Iran and Afghanistan. We opened it only for those two countries to watch the film without censorship because we knew that it could not be seen anywhere. And uh, we got amazing response from, of course, abroad Iranians of the diaspora, but also from Iranians inside who sent us messages, you know, um, uh, whatever way, um, saying that they were really touched. And many of them wrote saying that we had lived similar stories. And so I think it's very important. And I, I think the Iranian cinema has managed to go beyond that um, separation that the regime has been wanting to make us feel as individuals and artists that those who live inside Iran are, uh, have to obey the, these rules and those who are outside are not of us and, and they are against us. And, and uh, we just told them this, you know, now uh, we, we are making films, we are um, hands in hands. This panel shows it very clearly that uh, uh, whether you're inside or outside, somehow we, 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 we manage to make the films the way we want to and they cannot stop us anymore. And this is really something that's thriving through my films more and more. And um, The Siren, to come to the, uh, my last film, is uh, also an example of it in a different way. It is an animation film. I chose that medium to, to, to show and to talk about the war, Iran-Iraq war. And what was very important for me was to break this official narrative that the regime has always had from the Iran-Iraq war 
um, saying that if you're not one of us, you, sh you, you can't tell this story, this is not your story, you didn't go to the front, you didn't fight the war, so. And so Javad and I, we were both teenagers when um, the war started and, uh, and we lived through part of it those years, though none of us fought the war directly, but all of the Iranians were impacted. So um, the idea was to, to show through the life of a uh, teenager who fights that war, but not with the gun in a different way of how, and, and the uh, complexity of the Iranian society showing that the Iranian society contains communists, Armenians, uh, non-believers, also believers, you know, all of these um, different layers of the society that the Iranian regime has been wanting to, trying to erase or hide from the eyes of the world. So this film, as the Red Rose and as many other films of uh, of the Iranian uh, diaspora filmmakers, and uh, I'm glad to say the Iranian filmmakers inside Iran, uh, is breaking this curtain or tearing it apart to show that Iranian society is very complex, and, and that's what we're trying to do. Thank you. A and Milad, so you, your movie, Opponent, was also premiering at the Berlin Line this year, and Op Opponent is a Nordic co-production and shot mainly Swedish and Farsi. And, uh, and Zar, you worked actually as a casting director on this movie as well, and it is headlined by popular actor Payman Madi. Um, so Opponent follows a, a family of, uh, of Iranian refugees ending up in northern Sweden, and the hero, Iman, tries to maintain his role as a, as a family patriarch, and to increase his family chances of asylum, he, uh, he joins a local wrestling club. And uh, so on, on a deeper level, the film is, is about both the, the freedom and, and the lack of freedom. Uh, and even if you're going to a free country, maybe you don't necessarily feel free. Um, so, so also in, in your previous movie, The Charmer, um, uh, your hero emigrated from Iran to, to Denmark and is under threat of deportation. And to, to avoid that, he needs to seduce a Danish woman and marry her. Um, so. so how do you approach your status as an Iranian filmmaker um, I in the diaspora, working on films that obviously resonate uh, as well with the current situation? Well, I think, <coughs> I think for me, you know, I um, we left Iran in 1987, so uh, my parents kind of fled out of Iran. So the films that these two films I made was mostly about like two things, uh, about the refugee system in uh, Sweden and Denmark and how flawed it is, and a critique to Iran, like the, the regime, how it's threatening people and all of these things. So it's kind of, for me, it's much more looking at uh, Iranian character coming to Scandinavia and the kind of effect of you know, living in a country like Iran where basic principles, rights have been taken away from you and then gaining those things and how difficult it actually can be, even if they both succeed in their way. Uh, and, uh, yo, so both of them are co-productions. It's impossible to make these films in Iran. I mean, both of the films, I wrote them very shortly after each other. And both of the films are about men who their only currency is their body. So it's kind of like uh, both deal with themes of intimacy, sexuality, violence, freedom. D and these things aren't, <laughs> you can't make these type of films as the way I want it in Iran. Um, and uh, yeah, so, so it's kind of a, I just, you know, g growing up in <coughs> Sweden and kind of going, going to Iran all the time, it was actually how I became interested in films. I was like so obsessed with Iranian cinema, cinema because I was an outsider, you know. I like my image of Iran was from Kiarostami, you know. So it's it, that, that's where it kind of started for me. But the older I got and the more I got into films, it felt almost like a responsibility to tell stories where I have to say something about this regime that I know that people who's living in that system maybe can't, and it's very difficult for them. I'm not threatened by, you know, prison and stuff like that. So, uh, so that was kind of my approach to it. And living in Scandinavia, you know, it's kind of, 
I used to work in the refugee system with young uh, kids coming from Iran and Afghanistan, so I know that system very, very well. So that was also a way to say something about how we take care of people coming from countries and how much we, what we think they are going through and what they are actually are going through. So those are some questions. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. And, and Zar, you, you won the Best Actress Award last year um, in Cannes for your role in Police Fighter, Lin Vid Mashad, uh, directed by Ali Abbasi. And so Police Spider is co-produced between uh, Germany, Denmark, Sweden, and France. And uh, Ali initially tried to shoot in Iran. This couldn't happen. Then he tried to shoot in Turkey. This didn't happen. Then eventually the shooting moved to Jordan. Um, and so, so Holy Spider is not an uh, Iranian production shot in Iran, filmed in Iran, but it, it exposes the, the daily reality of uh, the, the life uh, in Mashhad back then, of prostitution, patriarchy, and social political injustices. Um, so uh, and you, you didn't only work uh, on this film as a casting director, but also um, as lead actress and, and then associated producer as well. So and. You, you said that even if it was shot in Jordan, the atmosphere, the look and feel really uh, Ali and you, you really wanted it to be really real and reflect Mashhad uh, at the time. So do, do you want to explain a bit more um, how on your experience working on this film um, and all the efforts made to stay close to reality despite being not shot in Iran? Yeah, no, sorry, I'm a bit sick. <coughs> uh, yeah, the we, we had these two, two choices, uh, either shooting in Iran and uh, keeping this uh, location authenticity, having actors Iranian inside, and uh, or shooting outside and then putting effort into it and we needed, you know, I think uh, that second option wouldn't be possible without the well understanding of producers because we needed them to just get the point you know sometimes i mean we are all experienced in diaspora cinema and when you're dealing with the european producers uh, you have always this um, argument that uh, your audience is not Iranian, they won't understand anything. Uh, it's fine if the actor has an accent or the location doesn't really look like, no one, no one can understand, no one get it. And, and um, I had the chance to work with Ali and then the producers who are, you know, they really did understand everything and they helped us to make it uh, in a real best, way possible actually and um, what was very str for me very surprising because at some point you know this casting of the <laughs> this movie took almost three years and uh, we, we met many actors outside Iran and then we decided to try with actors inside and Ali went to Iran and uh, we just organized a week of casting and auditions and it was really for me surprising that actors and uh, even people mm, in backstage, because we approached mm, some person in crew also in inside, they were all interested to work on this project, even even if they knew that it's gonna be risky for them, because the subject is uh, sensitive for the government and uh, working with a um, European production, working with me and Ali, all is kind of very risky for them. And uh, they joined us and they did it. And uh, you know, Mehdi Bajestani, who's the lead uh, role after last year in Cannes, he never got back to his home country. He's now stuck in, in Europe. We got very, you know, that's, uh, that's why, as Sepida said, it's not only about making a real movie, it's al also, you know, I it goes further it becomes political, even if we are just, you want just to talk about something social, you know. And this movie was a noir movie, it was very, you know, art house movie, but in the end we became all kind of politic people uh, without really, you know, Mehdi is a very simple guy, stage actor, amazing actor, and when he just decided to come, I asked him, <coughs> 
do you know you're risking your career in Iran and maybe you can't get back? And he, he said, you know that I have nothing to lose here. And I want just only one time, if it's possible in, in my life, doing something good, real, without this censorship. And that's how I have so much respect for those. And not only Mehdi is now like banned of working there, and if he goes to the airport, I think he's he gonna get arrested. But even Ali. Uh, can't go back, and many others in front of camera and uh, in backstage, they are already banned of working. And, uh, but on the other hand, you know, this, um, that you said, Asar, that we are second, uh, like, as women, we are second class citizens, but I think as um, filmmakers also, we became kind of second class citizens in our own country, but even in, in Europe, because uh, you know, to make this movie, Holly Spider, Ali could do this in this uh, real way. You know, we went to the Turkey, Turkey didn't let us to do the movie two months, just two months before the shoot, because they are in a good relationship with Iran Iranian government. And they didn't, they really kicked us out. And then we went to the Jordan, and uh, we had lots of problems to bring people there, because there is no, like a uh, relationship, uh, political, and n nothing between Iran and Jordan, and we needed people to come from Iran, you know, and and then how we can make it in this authentic way, and uh, you know how it took us time and money, and uh, Ali was in that mm, place in his career to be able to ask for it and to do this with again still with a little money, but more than, for example, maybe Sepida when you did Red Rose, I, I guess. So this is, for me, I think, to be able to continue making movies in a free way without that those red lines, which is, you know, for me, always, I think uh, everyone knows Iranian cinema, uh, Iranian so society through Iranian cinema. But I always say that th that face of Iran wasn't never a complete face. We are always so a half of it. And now we are, after all these years, experiences and trying to get everything, to put everything together and have an authentic movie. We are just trying now, I think we are there and we can make authentic movies, but we need help, we need, we are talking about industry of cinema. It needs money. And we need this understanding from funds, you know, all these European funds and uh, producers, distributors, you know, sometimes we are not even considered as a European. You know, we had this discussion before coming to Cannes that is Holly Spider an Iranian movie or a European movie? You know, and uh, Holly Spider was, um, um, from Danish uh, industry, we just did this campaign for Oscar, but we had also there this conversation, is it a European movie, Danish movie, or Iranian movie? I mean, we are second citizens here and there. Uh, in Iran, they don't let us to do a good movie if we are authors and we, we just want to stay close to the reality. And here also, we are not considered a re real filmmaker. It's just like a little money is there in the like the pocket of people and they give it to us. If it stays something in the end, that's gonna go to us and uh, so we can do something. Um, yeah, these are not, I, I mean, these are the difficulties that we are facing. It's not only uh, that authentic um, yeah. side of it. Yeah, and, and speaking about um, Mehdi Bajestani and the challenges and the risks, um, maybe let's spend more time on this from, from an economic and, and political standpoint as well. So I it's important to distinguish be between the challenges of those who stay in Iran and make films, uh, those who, who left Iran but returned there to, to make films, and the Iranians who make films about Iran, but 
who make them outside of Iran because they can't or don't wish to return there. So it's, it's a very complex landscape and, and also complex are the processes inside Iran. Um, so the, the life of Iranian movies uh, hangs on a long series of authorizations uh, and censorship can be unpredictable and arbitrary um, from script to production to marketing assets. At, at any point, the film can be cut or banned and stopped and added to this, of course, the, the massive inflation that, it, that is impacting investment in cinema um, in the country. So, so Kave, how, how are filmmakers uh, working locally dealing with these heavy processes? Okay, first I think that I should uh, thank uh, the opportunity that uh, uh, we have find this opportunity to sit here and talk about Iran, if we could. Uh, anyhow, these opportunities are very important, but not that much important as this hard condemned and harder condemned that any time we hear after this regular picture. This is this thing that we are facing every day with it, every day, and after that we are receiving a hard condemned. It's become die hard series, but die hard is an action this one is no action. This hard thing is only the sound of silence. Uh, yesterday I called to a friend of mine in the morning. I dropped a message to him. Hi man, how are you doing? He replied me back, still I'm alive. Still I'm alive and I didn't killed by shame of silence. But it does, it does kill me soon. This is our situation. In such a situation, how I want to talk about the censorship and the process of difficult of process that I have to produce such as this movie. It's nothing. This is nothing that we are doing to show a part of the reality which is happening in our society. A small part of the things that happening every single minute in our society. So talking about censorship, okay, we can talk. I wish that you asked this question from me last year because in these few months we learned a lot, you know. Yes, for 42 years, more than 42 years, for 100 years in our country, we are facing trouble with the censorship. I can tell you many of the rules of the censorship in our country, they are valid for more than 70 years. The first rules of uh, censoring the audio in Iran is for, uh, uh, around the, uh, uh, let me calculate, 82 years ago. The first written rules to stop audio in Iran written 82 years ago, and this rules is still valid. So what we did you know, through this time, we always try to deal in a way. We always try to bury the way with the censorship. You know, we try to find a way and pass it, do something else. We go one step behind, they came two steps in front. We always try to have this challenge to find a solution, going to round it, going outside, coming inside, hide our character, hide the touching, doing such as these things. And what we did, uh, what we find after many years of this, we find out that the only way to deal with censorship is to do not accept it at all. From the first step that we are accepting, the first censor in our ideas, this poison is coming inside the art, this po poison is coming inside our cinema, and we couldn't get rid of it. Off. Censorship is not a even censorship is a process is a cycle, you know? When the cinematograph, when the filmmaker is staying on this, you are doing something, we teach the government to how censor us, how to cut us. We doing something else, we make them more powerful. We learn how to do it more with us. You know, in 42 years, in last 40 years, we made a lot of beautiful movie. We give a lot of good uh, moment to the whole world of cinema, to the whole life that we give two good movies, many of our good cinema uh, f uh, uh, filmmakers. But in the reality, we also make the censorship process more powerful and more harder. We teach them. We teach them how to hide the hate. 
first time we try to hide the hair, 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 in, the hair in the movie, and then they use it against us. It's never hand, uh, ending. It's a defected uh, cycle, and we couldn't continue with this defected cycle. In the reality, last year, I can tell you, last year, maybe in May, June, I can say that really Iran independent cinema, the part was, was in Iran, we can say that it's finished. And even the government knew that we almost done. We couldn't survive financial-wise. We couldn't find any more tricks. We did everything, and we teach them that how we are making movie based on the short movie, and they stopped the short movies. We teach them that how we make a, a short movie based on the commercial uh, permission. They stopped that. You know, we did. We did. We told. Uh, we teach them that we can do it through animation, and they stopped the animation. We, we said that we will. We will use the uh, meta form. They stopped the meta form. They, they, they uh, steal our metaphor and they use it in any other hand. They try to fake independent cinema and they fake independent cinema. They make the cinema production that much expensive by purpose that the independent filmmaker is that couldn't do anything. This is all censorship. And really, really last year I can say that May, June, it was finished. And they knew that because they start to arrest our filmmaker after that. They start our uh, young and talented uh, documentary maker in a group of 10. They attack to Muhammad Rasulov, Mustafa Al Ahmad, and then Jafar. And they uh, start to go, go, arrest, arrest, and many of that. You know, Reza is laughing there because he's seeing his daily life, <laughs> daily moments. Okay, the things that help us that bring us here today, help us and give us this hope to do and work a little bit, was the Woman Life Freedom Revolution. <laughs> it, it gave us this courage, it teach us that if you wanna continue to be independent, you have to break this cycle. You have not to stay in this defected cycle, find a way, run away, coming again and doing like that. No, we understand it. We couldn't judge, we don't wanna judge, we couldn't say that uh, our masters, they made wrong and they make mistake to work on the cinema and uh, start to make it uh, uh, alive and survive. They have to do that and they did it. We are here because of them. But it's finished. If we wanna continue, if we wanna continue to be independent, if we wanna, ma wanna make production, if we wanna do film, we should not follow, we should not obey any sort of censorship anymore. We should not accept to go, to take any permission because asking permission means saying lie. And the dictator want us to be a liar. <laughs> he want to reproduce himself inside us. We should not accept to say lie. We should not follow the permissions. We should not follow any of these things. We have to give the chance to our young generation to find a free mind and do anything that they want. Thank you, Kevin. And Mi Mila, you had an early experience uh, working in Iran as well. Do you want to uh, tell us a bit more about the challenges you experienced? This was almost 20 years ago. <laughs> it was 20 years ago. It was when I made my first f uh, short film. And it was definitely a kind of schizophrenic experience because I met a lot of uh, Iranian filmmakers in Tehran who were doing all these projects that was provocative, uh, uh, regime critical, critical and stuff like that. Uh, but it was so, like you were saying, this difficulty of saying what you really, really want and being so afraid of the consequences. I met it all the time. And it was, for me, it was just so shocking because I, you know, I left Iran and I came there and I was like, oh my God, you can't even say what's in your heart in a way because it's so, uh, yeah, people were afraid of ending up in jail and stuff like that. But um, with my first feature, I actually tried to shoot it there with the charmer. I <laughs> made a very bad attempt of doing it, but it it was really, um, it like he was talking about, extremely difficult. I ended up 
sending up fake scripts, trying to get the permission, then got no. Then uh, I have friends over there who got me the permission falsely through a course. And it was just ended up this crazy. And I just realized that, okay, it, it's like impossible making it as I want it there, especially the first film because it had a lot of nudity and stuff like that. So yeah, it was a, it was a heartbreaking experience to see. Yes, a and, and today um, uh, Iran is, is experiencing, and, and we've all been saying it, like the greatest repression on Iranian cinema. Um, so you can be arrested, imprisoned, uh, held without judgment, then they can let you go on bail or not. Um, you, you can still work in Iran, win international awards, and they let you go for a while, then you are stopped at the airport and then you, your passport is being held. So it's like an unpredictable quicksand because it's not a state or law. Uh, so we cannot predict what's going to happen. And it's such in such uncertainty, uh, one need really to be to juggle, to be creative in order to, to for a film to be made. And then we will see what happens. Uh, so, so Asal, how in such a repressive system can independent films still be made? Um, yes, um, as uh, everybody said uh, uh, before, um, the first thing is, of course, the intelligence of the filmmakers in Iran. That's the first thing, who managed to get through uh, the censorship till now, till women like freedom. A after women like freedom, things are changing. But till now, till uh, women like freedom, so different tricks, a lot of negotiations, and but the important question I think that we um, we can ask now here is um, why an authoritarian and uh, dictatorial system accepts, uh, of course, within the framework of the censorship, that all these extraordinary independent films um, that uh, come to Iran uh, exist. W why they accept them from 1979? And I have, um, I think uh, there are uh, three major reasons for this. Um, the first is that uh, the state motivation uh, for social political reasons. Uh, I mean, it is to um, distract the people and uh, thus allow them uh, to have a breathing space. Um, in other words, a, a people without freedom of expression in Iran, without the right of demonstration, and um, who will at least, they will be able to hear their demands in the movie theater, you know? So uh, it, it is like a breathing space. That's the first thing. Um, the second reason is, is, of course, ideological. And uh, so they want to convey the ideology of Islamization through their production. That's the second thing. B and um, the last reason is, of course, uh, nationalistic. Um, Islamic Republic uh, wants to highlight the greatness of the country to show the West that Iran is an independent, technologically advanced country, and that is not the poor black country with no freedom that the West wants to make it believe. Um, so that's the three reason, actually, um, that they want, and so that help Iranian movies, independent movies, to, to exist and to carry multiple messages. Thanks, Asal. And, and about the support needed to, to create change, including uh, from the international scene. So I Iranian films that manage to travel f find a particular echo internationally. So for example, in France, uh, between uh, 96 and 2021, we had like 80 Iranian movies released in, in France according to the CNC. So that's on average like three per year, which is small, but which is also a lot for uh, Iranian movies in France. Um, so how do you explain this international appeal, Asal, and, and do timing maybe and political context influence the kind of movies that people on the international scene want to watch? Um, actually, uh, uh, of course, um, France has uh, largely contributed to the development of uh, Iranian cinema in the West and has made and still makes today important films in the history of Iranian cinema visible and possible. Uh, but the fact remains that Iranian cinematographic creation is even more extensive, more lively, more, you know, 
innovative and more audacious that it appears here. Um, if one takes a, a closer look at the trends of Iranian cinema in France, one notices that whatever the plot, it seems undeniable that films refer to the situation of the country and carry a message. It seems that Iranian cinema cannot escape a certain function, showing a particular reality of Iran. In fact, during the first 10 years of the Re Islamic Republic, the French media only showed violent images uh, of the war, hateful and fanatic speeches of clerics, and an extremely dark image of the people of the country. The Iranian film chosen by France then aimed to counter this discourse, uh, that of mysticism far from uh, the problems of Iranian society caused by the war and the revolution with non-professional actors uh, presenting an illusion of the reality of Iranians at that time. The French viewer uh, had the impression of watching real people while directors like Kiara Stami were the master of unnoticed uh, um, staging. Several years later, uh, nowadays, the French spectator now used to observing the social problems of Iranians still desires to see the real Iran through fictional films. Genre films uh, find their place as long as they make the spectators feel like he or she is on an immersive journey into the reality of Iran. The French spectator does not go to see an Iranian film primarily for its cinematographic quality, but rather for a form of exoticism, orientalism, or an offensive colonialism. The success of Iranian films in France is mainly linked to the geopolitical situation. At certain times, there is a craze, like now, and at other times, there is a neglect. Festivals and distributors highlight films that give the impression of seeing the real Iran far from the media cliche. Uh, Iran being a country quite close to the world, the French who are interested in traveling go to see Iranian films that give them the impression of immersion in the real lives of Iranians. Others will go to, to see this film because it surely gives them a good conscience to see the problems related to a country in difficulty. They feel like they are in sympathy when, uh, with an oppressed people. Uh, in short, sometimes um, film, qua film quality takes a back seat as much in the choice of distributors as in the choice of the public. But in any case, given the number of Iranian films shown in festivals and in France today, it goes without saying that this cinema has become an indisputable element in the world uh, visual culture and a voice for Iranian culture as well as a me messenger for its people. Yeah, and Zara, about the action that we can implement. So you were part of several uh, actions at Berlinale this year, and you, you mentioned like productive discussions uh, during the Gothenburg Festival raising initiatives such as residencies, or uh, you also, I think, already started a discussion with the European Film Academy about um, possible uh, help and support that they could bring to, to help uh, the Iranian movies be made. Uh, so uh, ca can you share more on, on these efforts? Yeah, you know, I think we Iranians, <laughs> recently we just try to get united and be together, but always I had this impression that I'm like a, uh, alone I Iceland, the others also, and we are doing uh, on our own everything we can, and this is actually part of that uh, doing, if, if putting effort in, you know, everywhere I go, I just try to get something for because you know yeah that that's good we have this panel we had this panel in berlin other too we had the action for tarane and uh, uh muhammad rasulov and uh, all those prisoners in iran uh in gothenburg okay that, that's fine that's really good i mean better than nothing and we need to um to be the echo of their voices okay but what's the solution i mean enough 
love, love, love and talk and uh, I'm a bit angry, you know, I'm just like, I, I, I feel I'm losing my time going to this festival and that festival, talking to different people and just trying, you know, I'm just giving a picture, deeper picture of my country and the situation that our cineasts and our filmmakers are in and our artists and um, in the end nothing happens. We don't have any Iranian movie in Cannes. You know, Iranian cinema got uh, kind of boycotted. I understand because it's really close. Everything happens with this uh, uh, dirty money of uh, revolutionary guard that they have the control of everything, especially cinema. Uh, but there are independent movie filmmakers also. I mean, there is a r really thin border in the I mean, I'm so sad that um, all, all those uh, amazing filmmakers that I have every year I see them in different festivals, they are not there, and they are not here now. And uh, you managed finally to get us this panel. Uh, you know, but that, that's why I say we are considered as uh, second <laughs> class citizens everywhere, even with my pal. I am considered as a second citizen. And uh, I don't know how many of uh, you here are producers or do you have any uh, power in industry, but I think we need concrete demands now from our side. We need mm, money to put it into the cinema. We need funds, we need maybe residencies for diaspora cinema and also for Iranian inside, filmmakers inside. You know, as long as uh, everyone, you said Asaba, I, I, I think, yeah, France is, um, I mean, France has a big role in Iranian cinema and the uh, Iranian filmmakers as Kiar Rostami, Pano, Hira, Sulov, they were always, um, Asghar Farhadi and uh, others, they were always welcome. But it's sometimes for me like we are condemned to do poetic movies or with metaphor. And uh, as soon as you go directly to those things that, that hurt you, like Holly Spider, no one wanted to see it in France. No one, we got many negative critics bec because it was brutal, but that's our life. That's our everyday life in Iran. And if you think that we have a poetic, poetic life, no, you're wrong. And uh, just, I mean, I'm trying to get this help to be able to do better movies with more, uh, I mean, l practical helps, not only having some talks and uh, thanks really to all the journalists because I think we had uh, lots of voices this year in many different journals and newspapers and TV programs and radio and everything, but okay, what's, what's going on in, in, in the industry? I really need to know that, nothing, nothing, even if, I, I do, I, I'm trying to ask, uh, I, I'm trying to get something, but uh, I feel alone. Uh, I think with Kaveh and the others uh, from uh, the new association that finally we, they created uh, six months ago, maybe we managed to just hands in hand get some more help, actually. We need it, we, we, without that we can't accept, expect uh, Iranian filmmakers inside not working without that money of Revolutionary Guard and what they do then. We need to help them to be able to continue their creative work. And even outside, you know, th th this is a big problem because it's just like we have a l foreign language movie, we want to make it outside Iran and it's just okay, two million, fine for you, go and do it. But no, it, it means remaking another country in a second country in a third country and that's even more, you know, you need more budget to do that. It's just you are making a historic movie. So yeah, I mean, if anyone can help, if anyone can uh, come up with a new idea how we can just manage to have more concrete help, please do it.
And Kave, you want to say a little more about ITMA's actions? Yes, uh, it seems that we, are, we have only we a few seconds. We have a few seconds, seconds for this. Uh, only I, 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 I uh, have to announce a few programs that we have today, tomorrow, and the day after. And especially, the, the we have two screenings. As Zar said, yes, we are upset, we are angry, we are stopped, but we are working also. We have to show to the world that still we have, and we have too many young, talented, uh, respectable, uh, respectable uh, new generation filmmaker in Iran, and this is our duty to support them. So uh, tomorrow, uh, 21st May at 12, we're gonna screen uh, one feature film from Iran who's done without any permission, underground, and is not following any rules of J Islamic Republic censorship. You can come, all you are all welcome to watch it. This is in film market, Riviera Cinema One. And the day after, 22nd May at 2 p.m. in uh, Cinema Tree, we do have a short views of a revolution, include six short films from Iran with subject of the re woman life freedom revolution. Please, you are welcome to watch that, what the new generation going to do in the next future without pressure, without censorship. There is another panel also today at five in here, which is doing by ACID, uh, is uh, with the subject of supporting creation from Kiev to Tehran. You are all welcome to come there. I will be there with the colleagues from Ukraine and the colleagues from Syria. Thank you so much, and thanks, Sahar, so again. Um, we, were, we were in mourning at the beginning of this panel. I would like everyone to stand up. Please, please stand up. Um, I think it's important to, to not be in mourning, but to applaud um, our brave young heroes um, and heroines who fight every day, who are imprisoned and uh, held and tortured and die, and uh, I think we should approve uh, and applaud their bravery. Thank you so much.